If you haven't been here today, you're with us. We've been preaching through uh, the book of Romans, uh, Paul writing to, to, to the Roman people there, and uh, we're, we're in chapter 8 today. We've kind of made our way through it, and we've kind of been kind of having a little party theme, and uh, I didn't do that today. Today I titled it Climbing Out, but if I was going to continue with the party theme today, it would be Drop the Mic, like uh, giving your toast, because... Uh, we're going to get into it, but that first verse in Romans chapter 8 says, so now, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I could drop the mic and walk off the stage, but we're not. I, I've got a little time. Josh is, I don't get to preach that often, so I've got a little time to, to break that down. But, uh, uh, but was really excited the more I got dived into this verse, uh, especially for me as an untrained preacher. It's really nice when, uh, when the head pastor says, hey, can you preach on Romans 8, 1 through 17? For me, that's half the battle sometimes is finding out what Scripture. But God's Word is anointed, so it doesn't matter what, what you pull out of it. It's going to be anointed. But today, uh, I've been uh, this week, and, and Josh is very gracious and gives me months to prepare for, so it's good for me. But uh, sometimes, I'll tell you, I'm just going to give you, sometimes when I preach and sometimes when I start to look at this and make sure that I uh, show myself approved to preach His Word, I get, I, get, I get into this knowledge, and, and I want to make sure that I share everything, and I can't because we'd be here for a couple of days. But today, what I'm hoping I can do is that deal to that verse of Scripture that I just read. My, my prayer this week uh, for you people that are in this room, for the people that, that, that potentially, and, and, and quite frankly, y'all may not know, there's quite a few people that watch our services uh, through, the, through the Facebook page and, and YouTube and uh, so, so for them, when they hear these words, that they really understand that there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And, and you know, for, as Christians, if you grew up in a church, that's almost some people's life verse, you know. And so we kind of just let it resonate, and we're like, yeah, yeah, but we don't really unpack unpack what the, the powerfulness of that statement. And so today, I'm hoping to unpack that. And when we get to the end of 17, uh, I hope there are some people that really understand what that means. And so... Without further ado, let's, let's dive into it. So Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, we're going to start there, and then we're going to work our way through 17. It's, it, 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 I believe. Anybody got the YouVersion Bible app up? Is it working? Hot dog. It's technology for some reason. Normally that's not my friend, but I'm glad it is working. And uh, so here we go. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the, weaken, the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son, by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement, some of them say the righteous requirement of the law, would be fully satisfied to us, or for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead, but instead follow the Spirit. And so, I don't know if you can tell that, but right now, uh, maybe you've never heard that there's no condemnation, but that is a picture looking up from the bottom of a well. And so, uh, and thinking about this is what it kind of came down to us. In case you didn't know, spoiler alert, we live in a fallen world. We have a sinful nature. And in fact, it's when we're born, I tell this all the time, you know, uh, the we sinner here and even before the we sinner. You don't have to teach kids to be bad. They're born with it. You've know, you got to teach them to be good. And uh, so we were born with a sinful nature. But uh, because of that, it's like we're in the bottom of a hole. This is, you know, uh, uh, we're under the rain of sin and death. And, and even though the law is not bad, you know, sometimes people think the law is bad. The law was good. The law was actually given for us so that we might become righteous if you could obtain the law. But we can't, right? And so it's like the law is standing at the top of this well saying, well, come on out. Put your hand here. Dig your fingernails in. Grab that. Come on, and you start trying to climb your way out, which we do sometimes in our own ability, right? We try to climb. I, I can do this. I'm going to do this, and inevitably, it doesn't matter if you make it two feet or 20 feet, uh, you're going to fall. 
And then the law is like, nope, that's wrong. You don't measure up. You're back down. Get down to the bottom. And so, uh, so I just want you to paint this, this picture, okay? So no matter how hard you try, I mean, you could exhaust yourself trying to climb out of this hole. Even with the instruction of the law, and it's good instructions, right? Don't murder. <laughs> don't steal. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. All those things, right? Okay, okay, you, you can't obtain it. And so the law is trying, and then he's like, well, I, I, I don't know what to do. And so God says, I know what to do. So it's like the, so, so it's like the law and God, they, they, they put this lifeline down to us in the bottom of the well. And it says here, so God did what the law couldn't do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have, right? I've, I've, I've kind of realized that this week, like, couldn't have God done it a different way? Absolutely. But the way that he did set in place, flesh had to beat the law. We couldn't do it in our own weakened state of our sinful nature. So God sent his son Jesus. For God so loved the world, right? I'm not going to give a spoiler alert, but over in Romans chapter 3, it's, it talks about that love fulfills the law of Christ. And so for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. So Jesus takes this lifeline and he climbs down in the bottom of this pit and he says, get on my back, I'm carrying you out of this thing. So when he says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. It's for those that belong to Christ Jesus. So I don't, I don't want you to miss that boat. So if, if you have never, and it's not about believing that Jesus is a historical figure. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But it's believing that he is who he says he is, that he can do what he says he can do. And, and his promises are things that he has and will carry out. And so I want you to understand this illustration, uh, and, and hopefully today we're going to teach you how to climb out of that, right? Because uh, that's, that's a life verse. We throw it, oh, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ, like we do it. But then we live in a state, under the state of condemnation, condemnation right? Now there's things that we, we're able to pass off, oh, yep, no, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. But there, for me, and maybe it's just me, there's things that, that want to just kind of hold me underwater. Even though I know this, I know this, these few verses to be true, there's some things, yeah, but Micah, so we're going to talk about that here. So keep going with me in Romans. This is, this is kind of where it fleshes out what this looks like. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit Think about things that please the Spirit. So there's a contrast going on. You know, and when you just read that, think about just, uh, and we're going to talk about it, but I'm going to tell you, the battlefield is in the mind. Okay? Whether or not you choose to climb out of that pit, it starts right here. And we're going we're gonna to flesh that out. So, but just, just, just for, I'd like for you to have some, some application here. So just, we'll take this weekend. Think about where your thoughts were this weekend. Those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things. And that doesn't have to be super carnal things. That could be selfish things, right? Because a sin, sinful nature talks about self. So just maybe some of you are like, you know, I'm just going to stay in this weekend because I know I probably should go do this, but I'm just going to hang out this weekend. I need a day for myself. It's all about me. So it can start there. And so the idea is, is, that's on one side. So think about your weekend this weekend. How, how was your weekend in your mind? What did you think about? What did you, maybe, maybe it wasn't just in your mind, maybe because it starts here and ends up going to your, 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 your members, right? Paul talks about it. We'll talk about that in just a sec. But he says, But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. What are things that please the Spirit? Maybe that's where we start. Maybe I've got I to gotta win this battlefield. I've got to start doing this in my mind, things that, that please the Spirit. And then it goes back here. So this contrast back and forth. It says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Okay? But think about that battlefield. If there was a scoreboard on, in, in, the, in, in the game that's going on in your mind, the battle that's going on, sinful nature, spirit. Which one's ahead right now? And we're in, a, we're in a room filled with people that I, you know, the majority of you profess to be Christians. So shouldn't our scoreboard be, we should just be kicking it out of the park on the spiritual side of things and the sinful side not. But if you're like me, there's a lot of days, there's a lot of weeks, there's sometimes at months that I feel like 
sin is, is winning. But if you read the rest of the Bible, there's going to be a fourth quarter comeback like no other. Okay? But, but just think about this contrasting. So letting the sinful nature control your mind leads to death. So it's like I, I, I've actually had some conversations just this week, but young people, people my age and younger, are, are not saving money hardly at all. Most of them don't have a savings account at all. Most of them don't have some sort of retirement. Uh, I guess they're banking on that when they get to be 65 that the, the Social Security is going to carry them through retirement, but they don't. But they can wrap their mind around that at some point, if by God's graces... They're going to live to be old, and they're going to need money. You would think they'd be able to put some money back. like, But we don't. Same way here. If you follow the sinful nature, it will lead you to death. That is a guarantee. That is a truth. But don't we... So how do we do that? So we're going to, here we go. We're going to keep going. I'm going to tie it all together. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. You see the contrast here? I don't know about you guys. How many of y'all would like a little more life and peace in your life. That's me. I'm telling you, I'll be 38 in December. This has been, 2019 has been the toughest year for me. And it wasn't that, that, that things were bad. It was just, man, just in that grind. I could use a little more life and peace. And so I'm, okay, God, I'm, I'm hearing, how do you let the Spirit control your mind so you can have more life and more peace? So here we go back to the sin. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws. You know why? Because it can't. It never will. So you can try. You, th- you may think you can reinvent the wheel. Oh, I'm going to do this sinful deal, and, and we're eventually I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get that formula. It doesn't. I promise you. God's Word says it. It doesn't. You can't ever obey it. It's always been disobedient, and it always will. It can't, it can't ever do it. And it says that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. So this verse kind of hit me hard, right? There is a battleground, and we do. We live in a fallen state. We're, we will never get to fully enjoy that until we get to heaven, not having that temptation. In, in. But, but it doesn't mean we have to wait till we get to heaven to start having some victories in that. And so, so you find yourself over here all the time. And, and, and for me, it, it's what Paul, Josh talked about it. He, he doesn't call it that. Last week we were in Romans chapter 7. I call it the Dr. Seuss verse. You know, I, I, I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I want to do. To me, it sounds like Dr. Seuss uh, uh, was in there. But that's what he was saying. Like, we desire, in my mind, I want to do these things of the Spirit, but the mind controls the members, and then my members end up going to do this. And, and that's why, like, uh, uh, I was trying to think of some things. Like, man, you get up, and you read the Bible, and you've had, you, you know, you just, man, you just... I don't drink coffee, but you just sip your coffee and you're like, man, I've had a good morning with God and you get ready and you get out the door and all of a sudden, your kid forgets their lunchbox. Any of y'all ever happened, that happened to you? And it just, all of a sudden, you're zero to 60. On, what do you mean you forgot your, and you're just, it, it, and it happens like that, right? Well, it's kind of like this. We are in a default state. Our default setting is sin. I've started reaching this. Kids won't understand this, but does anybody not set their alarm clock and pretty much wake up the same time every morning? It's what happens when you get older, right? It becomes our default. We've done it so long that, that, that it, you don't even need an alarm clock. It's just default in it. So that is our sin. So in order to live by the Spirit, you have to become intentional, right? And this is the hardest part. This is when I get to disciple people and talk about it like they come to know Christ. They are found in Christ Jesus. And at salvation, the, the, the Spirit comes and indwells in them. And then you can constantly ask the Spirit to fill you up. And then you should be filled up. And then you should pour it out. But I was like, that doesn't happen just because you go to bed and you wake up and you're saved. It doesn't. You have to, the default is here. That's why you can spend all morning with God. Three hours maybe. Pray, sing, worship, making breakfast. Then you get in the car and somebody pulls out. Boom. It just comes out. Because we've been defaulted, and that's, and so you have to work towards that. So even when those things come out, right? Parents ever just, you know, you had a bad day at work or something wasn't going got good, and maybe you're just reading an email, and you got some bad news, and they come and ask you a question, and you just immediately just jump down their throat. They haven't done anything, but you take it out on them, 
right? That is the sinful nature coming out. And so here's where, here's where I think you can start seeing the Spirit because, and let me tell you what the Spirit is. God is the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, and the Spirit speaks to us, right? God speaks to the Spirit, the Spirit speaks through us, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So as you began to read this, you get to understand God's character, and the Spirit begins to write it on your hearts, right? He talks about that in the Old Testament, that He comes and He writes it on our hearts. And so then you're like, okay, I messed up. You know, because there's a difference between condemnation and conviction, right? So conviction is a good thing. Condemnation is, is, used, is, a, is, a, is used by sin. Conviction is used by the Spirit. And it's just one of those other things that the enemy, he wasn't very original. All he does is take what God does and uses it against us, right? He perverts it a little bit. So he uses condemnation to hold us over down, hold us down in the pit. And the Spirit is telling us who we are. This is what God says, that you are not condemned, right? Jesus came down in the pit for you and for me to pull you out. So why are you going to stay down in the pit? That condemnation was two things. It was the penalty of sin, right? We think about it. He bore our, he bore our cross. He, it was our cross to bear, but he bore it. So he did away with the, 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 the penalty of sin, right, which is death. He did that for us. But he also did away once and for all the condemnation of the power of sin. So there's some people that want to believe in him that I know that he forgave me of my sins and thank you, I'm saved. But he also did away with the power and that's where the magic happens. That's where the Spirit can really, whenever you really understand what Paul was trying to get these Romans to understand and, and even us today, that's where it happens. That Spirit has to begin to speak. So you have to understand who he is. That's why it's so important that you read his word and his promises. And so we're going to keep doing that because it says right here in verse 9, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. And here Paul is trying to just remind them. He, can, he kind of said, hey, yeah, they would probably more relate to this top part of the sinful. Well, I would, if I had to draw a line, I'm going to be more over here. And he's like, no, 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 no. Let me tell you who you are. This is where Paul is trying to speak some life into them and remind them what Christ did, breaking the power and the penalty of sin. He gets them over here. He says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And so, right? And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And so let me just interject there. You can't do this without Christ. You can't do this side of the line, the Spirit, without Christ. So it starts with a submission. It starts with a belief. And not just a belief. Yeah, I believe that He's... Jesus, I believe he was a historian. It means that he is uh, not only Jesus that, that came and died on the cross, but the Jesus that rose from the dead and is in heaven and that you want him to be the Lord of your life, right? It's that Savior and Lord, right? Because the demons believe in Jesus. But you've got to believe in that gospel message of what Jesus is, and so that's where it starts. And if you're here today and you've never knew that, man, I, we're going to talk. Right, if you don't know Jesus today, there's no way you can... I don't care how good you think you are. The enemy's going to get you. He's going to find that one thing. That one thing to, 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 to condemn you with. And guess what? He has every right to do it. Because that is the law. If you mess up, you deserve death. But thank, thank goodness, thankfully, God sent His Son down in that hole, Jesus, to put us on His back, put that cross on His back, and to carry us out of that hole. Not so we could just get out of the hole, but we could experience that life and peace that he talked about. And so he says here, and Christ lives within you. So here I'm, he, he's trying to give you a little pregame speech to get you pumped up. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God I want y'all to listen to this. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give, you, give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. So we're starting to unpack what this looks like. And so you have to be intentional about it. And so when you mess up, because guess what? You're going to mess up and you feel like he's putting us over here under condemnation, all you got to do is remember what Christ did for you. 
And that is, is what, he, what he's trying to tell you is the same, I can't do it, it's too hard. Y'all ever said that? It's just too hard. You feel, to, you know, then you get a good night's sleep and you come and you remember what Christ did for you. You don't have to lose the day. You don't have to lose the minute. You don't have to lose the hour. You just got to remember the Christ, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives within you. You got to speak to yourself. You got to let that spirit speak to you. You got to know what those promises are. And so here's the cool thing. This is, this is, this is kind of where we're going to hang out this last few verses. But I want you to understand it's a battle that goes on in your mind. You have to be intentional about it. And when you mess up, ask God to forgive you. And if you wrong somebody, watch. This is, this is where I've seen, I, I still believe in my heart of hearts that if people would begin being reconciled to each other, you know what that means? Like when you've wronged somebody, you go to them and you say, I'm sorry. I, I really do think that would usher in revival. I think the Spirit could could do some amazing things through people's hearts. Because not only now you've wronged people, there's so many different layers. Of like Now you don't even know if you've wronged. So there's so, it's social media and what? You, I don't know about y'all, but like somebody will send me a text and there's 28 different ways you can read a text message. And literally somebody would be like saying something just very direct and nice. That's how they bend it on this side. And the way we take it because we live in a, an offended state of mind over here because this is sometimes they want to condemn us to offense, right? All those things. He just wants to hold us under the water, and he told us in the first part of that chapter 8 is that Jesus defeated it. Like, and in fact, what, what you, what do you, this way he says in verse 12, this is another great verse. Therefore, dear brother, let me just remind you, Paul has been trying to get him beefed up. Here we go, so let me just say it like this. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You don't have to do it. And I know some of you have done it for so long, some of you have a lifetime of doing whatever that is. And you're like, yeah, I believe in Jesus that he can save me, I just don't think he has enough power to get me out of this. Right? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a, a, a just making bad, poor choices. Like it just seems like all we do is make poor choices. This is what his word says. You have no obligation to do it. You don't have to do it. Before you knew Christ, you were obligated to do it because you were living under this sinful nature. But Christ came to, to, to not just go head to head. He defeated it. It's done. It's finished. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the presence of that's not going to be in your life, but you don't have to be under the reign of that anymore. Is this enemy still roaming around like a lion seeking to... Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't mean he's got to eat you. You're under no obligation to do what your sinful nature. So I want you to think about it. Whatever that is, you know, like I said, we can, we can throw these things, like there's little things, you know, oh yeah, I got that. I can do this. Thank you, God, I did that. And then whatever it is, the shame of a poor choice that you did, you know, the shame. Whatever it is. The enemy just, it, it's, it, it, Turner and I talk about all the time, there's a guy that used to say that, that, the, that the enemy knows it's like we have these six strings like a guitar. He knows what chords to play on us to really get us going. And he just starts playing those, and you're just like a trance, and you just, oh. And you could be having the best day. And the last few weeks, it was like, we didn't really laugh about it. We hadn't got to that state. But Kimberly was like, man, he is just really working hard to try to steal our joy, and we would kind of get back to center. And that's kind of what this message is about is it's not that we're not, we're not going to win every battle. But let me tell you, we have the ability to win every battle. We do. That's what he says. We don't have to do it. But as we're being sanctified, right, it's a big church word, right, as God sees us as the finished product, as we're still trying to get there, we don't have to do that. And so here we are. We're trying to get back to center. And so what happens is we get to center real quick, right? Well, then we get over here in the sinful part. And we don't get back to center over here, right? It's the same way. When you come to know Christ, I can remember. I can remember when, when Jesus came and he saved me and I really understood what that meant. I couldn't sleep that night, right? And we talk about being on fire. And how many of y'all have been guilty? Well, give him three months. He won't be as on fire. Y'all ever said that? I've said it. Oh, well, he needs to be a more realistic Christian. You know, one of the things that I love, the story... Uh, uh, that my mom was telling me about a kid coming back from church camp. He started believing that, you know, as Christians, that we can lay our hands through the Spirit comes on us. We can lay our hands over the sick and they shall be heal, healed. And he was reading that and he came to Bible study. He's like, man, we got to go to the hospital. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, I just read that we can lay hands on the sick and they can be healed. Why are we not at the hospital? And they're like, oh, pfft. 
That is his word. So that's the faith that we, we got to do. But so many times, so we're here, and then we, then we kind of lose, we're coming back over here. But, but I don't know about you, it's just me. When I find myself under this condemnation, I end up staying over here for a really long time. You know, and then I'll, I'll get back to center, maybe even get a little more in my tank, and I'm starting to overflow, and then something happens. This doesn't happen as long as, as I want it to be. Now, now, I'll stay in this sinful part a really long time. And so the challenge here is to understand what Paul was telling them here and understand that the battle starts in our mind. And so maybe you, you know, faith isn't a feeling. I don't know if y'all knew that. Faith isn't a feeling. You know, uh, there was a comedian named Mark Lowry. I don't know if it's, it kind of dates me, but he used to say, you know, some days I'd wake up and I just didn't feel saved. He wasn't a morning person, he said. You know, if God wanted him to see the sunrise, he'd have put it at 12 o'clock noon. He said, I wasn't a morning person. But it didn't change the fact who he was, right? And so you've got to know his promises. You've got to know what he says. And so what starts is, are you one of those that are found in Christ Jesus? So once you've done that, I don't have to do check the boxes, but check. Now what? Now you start winning this victory in the mind. And so this is what he says. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. Promise, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now we're fixing to get into some of my favorite part of this. So y'all see what you got to put to death. Like you ever just feel it coming on you? Like, like whatever reason, you just anger is on you. Like you at the, you could just erupt. You don't know why. Like you really don't know why. You just feel it. It's you just got to put it away. Whatever you got to do to get your 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 jam on, right? Turn on that music. Whatever it is, whatever it is, that'd be a funny deal. Email me this week. What's your jam? What gets you in that? That you know, I right, dad just needs a minute. Right, give me five minutes. I'm gonna be right back. Whatever that is. He gives you the power to do that and to pray. And, and if you're not there, you know, I prayed. Amen. Nope. Pray again. Right? Stop, breathe, and pray. Until you get there. And let the Spirit begin to... You know, it's, 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 it's like you got two dogs. I think I've shared this before. What dog are you feeding? Right? You got your spirit dog and you got this sinful nature dog. If you keep feeding them both... They're always going to be at war with each other. But you start feeding this spiritual dog and not feeding, this one's going to get weak, and now all of a sudden your spiritual dog can start winning, right? Uh, there's probably some hashtag in there, feed the dog. But uh, maybe who let the dogs out? Maybe that's what we should have played. But here's where I want you to get, and this is really good. This is, this is where um, I've been excited to get to. So verses 15, 16, and 17. So... Some of you may not know, short, short story, I like to talk about him. He's not in here, so he would really enjoy it if he was. But So I don't even know now, Six, five years ago, we've had him home for about five years. And when I finally got him home, God put this scripture on my heart okay, about adoption. I have a, I have a son that we adopted from Ethiopia. Uh, I love him dearly. And yes, he's just, he, I, can, I can really understand that uh, and I was wondering. This is I got the platform, so I guess how many of you in your family there's some sort of adoption that went on? I always like to see that. Raise them high. Yeah, that's good. I like it. So this is going to resonate with you a little bit more. Although I did learn a lot of stuff this week about adoption in Roman culture, we'll talk about. But this is something that I, that I really understood. I, I didn't really understand how God could love us like Christ. And obviously, it's in and through Christ but he makes us co-heirs until I got my son, and, and, and now I can tell you, right, he's, he's a Martin, right? He's not an orphan anymore. He, he is a Martin. But there was times before I got him that I would pray, and I'm, I'm not some, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, what's the uh, Annie, the little lady, the, the orphan care? Somebody throw it out there. M Mrs. Hannigan. You know, I knew I wasn't going to be a Mr. Hannigan, right, to this kid. But having two biological girls of my own, I knew, with, and especially that, that daddy-daughter love, it was good, and so I, I would. I didn't even share it with Kimberly. We would kind of talk about it, and we could feel ourselves going there. We wouldn't talk about it anymore because we were scared. But I was afraid that I would love him, but I wouldn't love him as much as I love my girls. 
And that was a prayer that, God, that you would soften my heart. Because, I, you know, uh, I can tell you, if you want to know his story, I can tell you his story. But uh, I wanted to make sure, because obviously God did it both ways, right? Had biological girls, and, and I thanked him for that. But there's something different when, when somebody else has a child and God places them in your trust. There is a, a extra weight, uh, uh, extra, uh, you want to be very careful. There's a, we call it rescued love is what we call it. It's a different kind of love. It's a rescued love. And so, so I started doing this. And so this is where this is going to be really cool. So bear with me. I think we've got time. If we don't, we'll go through the Sunday school hour. But it says, verse 15, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slave. So here he is, he's speaking life into these Romans. But don't we, aren't we slaves to fear? Like, we are. I mean, just think about it. You know, we're not there yet, but we got some friends that are starting to have some kids old enough to drive. And uh, uh, I almost feel more sorry for, like, my parents who didn't have cell phones and Life360 to kind of figure, figure it out. But... Man, like I have a hard time letting my children ride with my friends sometimes. And it comes from fear. It's not discernment. It's not like, oh, it's, it comes from fear. But how much fear dictates our decision-making? Even in good things, you know? Even in good things. But we did not receive that spirit. It's not a, a spirit of fear and, and, uh, and slaves. And I, so watch this. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children, and now we call him Abba Father. And that's like a, like a daddy, right? I remember one of my first sermons after we got Silas, uh, before he could learn to speak, he called me Gung Gung. So that's like, man, I, I, uh, now he's very articulate. In fact, y'all get a kick out of this. He loves watching Peppa Pig, and so sometimes he comes in there with his British accent and says, well, hello, Daddy Pig. And uh, uh, that one doesn't ring. I said, quit watching Peppa Pig. But... Uh, but it's like, it's, it's that intimate relationship that we get to have. It's not like we're just this, we're Mr. he's the Mr. Hannigan and we're just under his roof, which would be still a great roof to be under, but, but we get to call him dad, right? And so here we go, we're going to go on the side. I began to understand, I tried to go, okay, what, did, what was adoption? Because we think of adoption as a humanitarian thing. This is really good, we're going to get there. And so back in Rome, when Paul, he was fully aware of the adoption process in Rome, which they had at that time. But basically, you had these, I'm going to call it patriarchal powers, okay? And so over here, you got the patriarchal power. The power of sin and death was reigning over here, okay? And then you had the patriarchal power of God, right? God's power. And so in the Roman world, the, that patriarch, that man, he had absolute power. Didn't matter if he was crazy didn't matter if he was, uh, you know, should have been taken out to the pasture and laid to rest. As long as he was alive, whatever he said went. Even if, you know, the son that he had was providing, making all the money, didn't matter if, if grandpappy was still alive, he was still that patriarchal power. And so, in Roman culture, it became more, more of a, like an exchange, a business exchange. So if this son, there's a couple, there's a couple ways it could happen, but if this son was under this patriarchal power and he wasn't, you know, he was tired of being used and abused by this power, he could find another family to adopt him. And there was a big ceremonial deal that went and they had scales and they would put, I think it was copper on one side and it would weigh the scale down and then the dad would come back, his real dad would come and buy him back. They would do this twice and on the third time, it was not bought back. It was broken. So at that point, he became adoptable. And so whoever the adopted father would come, and he would, he would then put his side on there. So it's a big ceremonial deal. That's just extra. So then the son would come, and he would be over here. Okay, so it was more of a business transaction. So he could do another son, right? Uh, and, and even if he had biological sons, he liked this guy over here. He could do that. And, and, and the cool, other cool thing that, that when you can relate it to this text is you could adopt, well, you couldn't adopt slaves, but if you had a slave that you liked, and remember, slaves wasn't how we think of slaves here in the United States. Some people, you know, they, they chose to be a slave to kind of pay off debts or whatnot, but they, could, uh, but they could adopt a slave, but in order to adopt a slave, the slave had to first become a citizen. 
And so, you know, the, 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 the illustration is here is that we were slaves to sin and death. And, but in us wanting to be adopted, choosing to be adopted by God, allowing Him, believing who He is, He makes us citizens of heaven. So therefore, we can become adopted. But I want to read these because it was the consequences of adoption that make what Paul was trying to really nail home to these Romans. And this is what it says. There were four main consequences in a Roman adoption. One, the adopted person, so the person that was being adopted, lost all his rights to his old family. So I want you to think about it in this contrast. So you're under the patriarchal power of sin and death, and now we're over here considered children of God. We lose, he has no more power over us, right? It says, uh, all right, he lost all rights to his old family and gained all the rights of a fully legitimate son in the new family. Isn't that good? I want you to think about that too. It followed, uh, uh, it followed that he became heir to his new father's estate. Even if other sons after him were born, he's still considered equal. And so I laugh at that, right? Because I have had people, in it, and I love to talk about adoption, but there were some people that, after I adopted my son, they're like, so what happens if you and Kimberly pass away? What happens to life? Well, well, I go to heaven. What do you, oh, no, like, what do you, like, with your inheritance, are you going to leave some money? To, like, you're going to leave him a college fund? And then I was like, I just never thought. I was like, no, I have three kids. My whatever I have, it probably won't be much, but whatever I have, we'll split it into thirds. He's my son. Really? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> but, but to each their own, right? Anyway. But yeah, number three, and this, this is really like, in law, in the law, once this ceremonial place, once this happened, once this exchange took place, the old life of the adopted person was completely wiped out. So in the ado Roman adoption law, if I'm over here, I get adopted over here, once I do that, if I had some uh, felonies and misdemeanors and bad debts, gone. They're over here. So think about that. So Paul knew this Roman adoption, this, this adopted sons, and this is what he was trying to emphasize to really make the exchange, and they would have been fully aware. And then in four, in the eyes of the law, the adopted person was literally and absolutely the son of the new father. Like it wasn't like, oh, that's your adopted son. It was like my son. Uh, I had fun. I had a conversation with a guy the other day, and uh, uh, we were having an exchange, and I said, I don't know if you know a lot about my son. They're like, well, no. I said, well, he's not my biological son, and he got really tickled at that. But he is my son. I love him just the same. He gets whoopings just the same. He gets, uh, he gets, you know, he has to eat his vegetables just the same. I mean, he is, he is our son, and that's what uh, was, was really cool. And so when it says, uh, verse 16, for the Spirit joins with our spirits, spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So the other thing in this Roman adoption that I thought was really cool, I know we don't give you this much history, but it really nails home this point. And then we're, I'm hoping some people are really going to come out of that way to that condemnation of whatever it is. I've been praying, whatever it is. So when they would do this ceremony, there would be seven witnesses in the Roman court. They would get a magistrate to kind of do it. They'd have seven witnesses. That way, because it happened, years later, somebody died, that patriarch power dies, and guess what? children began to fight over the inheritance. And they would say, but you're not legitimate. You're not ours. And they would have these seven witnesses that say, oh, but wait, he is. Because it was done. When it was done, it was done. When that last, when that adopted, new adopted guy put that copper on there, it, it finished, right? And so when it says, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm, to testify. And so any time that the enemy's wanting to, this, this patriarchal power is of sin and death is saying, but you're not, but you're not. You've got the Spirit over here saying, oh, but wait, he is, she is. And, 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 and since we are his children now, since we are his children, we're, this is what happens. Not only do we get his inheritance, says verse 17, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are his heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his sufferings. That's, that's, what, that's his inheritance, right? So we get to share his sufferings, which produce a peculiar kind of glory in heaven. But we are, we are there. We are there. 
And so here, here's where the big takeaway today, because we can, I could, I could just get up here and read Romans chapter 8. Fact, by the way, I think it's one of the greatest chapters in the whole Bible. I asked Josh, I said, hey, are you preaching the rest of chapter 8? Because if not, I'm probably just going to keep going, nor heights, nor debt. I mean, it's a great chapter. If you're feeling low and you feel like you've been c- condemned over here, just read Romans chapter 8 and let it talk about God's love and what he did for you and what you, who you are. You're a child of God. So just wrap your mind around that, that you are a child of of God. And I know some of you in this room right now are having a hard time. You're not worthy. Guess what? You're not worthy. You're not. You deserve to be in the bottom of that pit. But God so loved the world that he sent his son to dive, to call, to come down and pull you out of that pit. Not just to get you out of that pit, but that you could live a life full of peace and that abundant life that he talks about. But how do you do that? Well, first you've got to believe and do what he says to do. You're not under any obligation to do that, those old things. Now, I realize they creep in because we've been on default so long. But the challenge is, is to ask God for help. To be intentional about it, right? Have any of y'all got to the point now? I know it'll be like that. New Year's is coming, right? We do New Year's resolution. And we get to this point that like, why even try? Because I know in two weeks... I'm going to be right back. That's not the mindset you take on today. Where I want, I want you to, we're going to have this altar open, open here in a minute. You've got your seats. And, because I'm going to tell you, coming to church is not going to, those, those things that the enemy's been condemning you with, that guilt, that shame, that anger, whatever that is, that's not just going to be fixed because you come here good what God's Word says. That, that, be, that begins to be fixed when you put your mind around it and you say, oh, that is not who I am. Maybe you have to say it out loud. That is not who I am. That may have been who I used to be, but this is what God says. Satan, I'm no longer obligated. And he knows. He knows that. Doesn't mean that he's still not going to try to remind you, but he knows. There's nothing he can do. There's nothing that he can say if you realize that you are a child of God, that you've been given that rescued love. Right? Because he did. He rescued you from sin and death. And you began to be intentional about it. Don't give up. Don't say, I'm not even going to start it because I know I'll fail. And if you can win the day, right? Win the next situation when, you, when your kids are yelling in the back and you, have a, you just want to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger in kindergarten and cop and just say, shut up. But just to find that, just to wrap your mind around, just win the day. And I promise you, when you have that victory, and it may be a small victory, there is a celebration that happens in your spirit. And you've got to latch on to it, right? When Jesus comes down in that hole, you've got to latch on to him and say, Get me out of here. I'm holding on. I can't do it on my own. But celebrate those victories. And this is where church comes, right? Share those victories, right? One of the things that we try to do, you know, it's almost like, okay, today, 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 we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to choose joy, you know, because James tells us that we should consider it pure joy when we go through trials. Well, how do you do that? Well, you choose it. I know that... Uh, uh, Jose will appreciate this, you know, trying to get a car fixed, right? This part don't work, you got to go to another part. Oh, my God. I, I mean, I could. I could go out. I just want to just put a rag in the gas can and light it on fire. Y'all ever done that? You know? I don't know why this came to me, but uh, I can remember this. My dad will appreciate this. I can remember at our old house, I was a teenager, and we had this pecan tree that you mowed around, and we had a bird feeder hanging off of it, and every time he would mow... He would forget that limb was there. But one day, we heard the chainsaw fire up, and he cut the limb off, and the bird feeder and all came down. But you know what? It didn't hit him in the head anymore. He, he chose to have victory. I don't know if he was mad operating that chainsaw or not, but you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. It's not going to be your default. It can become your default. The more you do it, the more you, you gain muscle, more, the more you gain... That, but it can't just be a routine. It has to be intentional. Whatever situation, maybe on tomorrow you're going into school and you know first hour if you're a teacher, that class is on your last nerves. I've been there, right? Y'all don't deal with the 6th and 7th grade youth. It's the armpit of the youth group. But God loves them, so I should too. So you have to... But be intentional and see them as God sees them. You know, people... 
You know, love fulfills the law. You've got to love people, but you can't, I'm telling you, you can't love people without the love of Christ in you. Some people are just too hard to love, but you get Jesus in you. And so today, this is how I'm going to end it. Whatever that is, I've been praying that whenever I say that, whatever that condemnation that the enemy's been holding you under, whatever it is, maybe it's a secret that nobody knows. Your wife doesn't know, your husband doesn't know, your boss doesn't know, your best friend doesn't know, but you know. And this patriarchal power of sin and death knows. But God knows too. And he says, you're not obligated to it anymore. Why are you letting him have power over that? Give it to me. Because he's defeated, you know? It's like playing, you know, it's like boxing somebody, and you know you could just give them that haymaker punch and it'd be over, but you're just sitting there sparring with them. You don't have to spar with them anymore. You can give them the haymaker and move on. But I'm telling you, some of you have been under that condemnation your whole life. And it came maybe from a dad or a mom that told you you were worthless. And you just can't get over it, but... God says, you are my son. You are my daughter. You don't have to live under that way anymore. You can live under this way. So my prayer for you today is don't walk out of these doors the same way you came in. Give it to God. Don't live under that condemnation. I hope you're hearing that today. And So I'm going to pray. They're going to sing. We're going to pray. And if you don't know Jesus, let me tell you, you can't be on the, under this patriarchal power. And let me tell you, that, that contrast that we talked about, it is, it, even, it is even more black and white than that. I can't even tell you how. Come over here, but you can't come over here unless you surrender to God. And it is a surrender. It is raising your white flag and saying, I can't do it on my own. I need you. I want to put my faith and trust in you. And if that's you here today, I would love to be down here to to pray with you, to talk to you. If you need to talk about it for a lengthy period of time, because that happens. In fact, most of the time we end up talking to people during the week because they get, I want you to wrap your mind around it so the enemy can't condemn you. Like, oh, that didn't really happen. That's what happened to me. Oh, were you really say? Yes, I was. And I'm over here now. Don't let that doubt. That's one of those tactics that he used. But if that's you, we want to talk about it. But if you've been under that condemnation for so long, I'm praying that you would come, and I do. I pray that you come right here. You don't have to. This isn't anything, but sometimes it's that posture. If you're tired of being under the weight of that condemnation, come and give it to God and be done and walk out of here with that label that says, hello, my name is child of the one true king. You don't have to walk out of here. And and let me tell you, come Monday morning, maybe Sunday in your car going home, the enemy's going to come and try to put that back on you, but you you can give it a haymaker once and for all. So they're going to sing, I'm going to pray, and then it's time for you to do business.